Tom Kui presents The Royal Ramble, an episode-by-episode -episode celebration of the classic British sitcom The Royal Family. To get in touch with the show, email us at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com. Hey everyone, it's Tom Kui here, back for another edition of The Royal Ramble. This is my long-form Royal Family podcast. I appreciate you listening. Today we are tackling the final episode of the third series, that being Christening. And I'm very excited to get into this one because, I mean, it's a blooming classic, isn't it? So just before we kick off with the analysis and a quick email as well, a bit of housekeeping. There are many things you can do to help the show. If you enjoy the show, you can, of course, go back through the archives. You can tell a fellow royal family obsessive about this. You can share. You can go on iTunes and leave us a five-star review and maybe some kind words over there. You can email us, theroyalramblepod at gmail.com. And I especially love to hear from you. And I've got a great email to read out in a moment. And, uh, yeah, just let me know what you think about my thoughts on the show, your thoughts on the show, how you got into the show always fascinating to hear those origin stories and all that good stuff we're also over there on twitter on youtube gonna read a youtube comment out as well kind of wherever your rss feed takes you you can find the raw ramble we are on patreon as well so i used to do this where it was like a month in advance or whatever but unfortunately i'm working on other podcasts projects and just other stuff in general life so the patreon now is more of a kind of like you know premium pay-per-view sort of thing like you'll get access to the next episode a couple of days you know four or five days before it drops on the main feed and i'll put everything else on there as well like the quiz episodes and stuff like that so yeah if you really want to support if you really want to dig deep then you can support us on patreon as well and of course that is greatly appreciated Okay, and just before we get to the rambling, I want to start with two bits of correspondence. The first came in, I think it was just this morning, actually. Yeah, it was 10 hours ago this came in. This is on the YouTube channel. This is a comment on the second episode, that's Making Ends Meet, which was quite a while ago now in the scheme of Raw Ramble. And this is from Analysis of Logic. And here the commenter is replying to my kind of baffled state about the Tory mug that you always see in the Royal family household. And it's never really made sense to me. So here's what they say. I wonder if the Tory mug was put in as another I wonder if the Tory mug was put in as another nod to Jim's cheapness. If it was given away free as part of a local canvassing campaign, which would be likely, as it's probably not an item that shops would sell in a type of working class area where the royal family upper trade is living. And even if it was, I don't think Barbara or Jim would buy one. Penny pinching Jim would have taken it willingly because it was free, and anything given away free, even by the Tory party, would trump any political conflict Jim may harbour against them. Now, I love that. That is some great thinking there. And Perhaps you're right. I feel like it's almost Jim just doesn't care about the minor details. I don't think he's the sort of person. I mean, we, we've not heard his political allegiances. Barbara has made reference to the Labour Club. That was when Nana comes round. I think it's the first time when she's leaving and Barb says there's that bold comedian that she loves there and Nana just says she likes him but has no interest in actually seeing him it's a great moment there but um analysis of logic what a great analysis of logic there because yeah i mean would a local campaigner give out just tory tea there it does have a blunt kind of chipper britishness to it so perhaps they would but still really dig that comment and again guys go on the youtube channel if you're not aware i put all the episodes on there and there are comments on the videos from time to time and um, oh what am i thinking i should also direct you guys to a brand new video on the youtube where i compile every single mention of an off-screen character on the royal family so we're talking like you know everyone from marion at northwest water and beverly macca the kind of more obvious ones to the more obscure entries like darren's uncle jack for example you remember him who burnt down his own pub so yeah, check that out. Just search the Royal Family Podcast, the Royal Ramble on YouTube, and you'll find that video and all the other ones in the past. Okay, and finally, we have an email from Jacqueline. And Jacqueline says, Hi Tom, I discovered the Royal Ramble recently when I searched for the Royal Family specifically, as I love it now as much as I did 23 years ago when it first aired. I didn't expect to find anything, maybe an episode somewhere, so I was delighted to find you and people who love it as much as me. I was a few years older than Denise in 1998, and I think I loved it because it was so relatable. We'd go to my parents, watch TV, drink brews, have Sunday dinner, watch Antiques Roadshow, go to the Offy for crunchies and Turkish delight for my dad, and I remember watching all the shows on their TV when they were on our TVs. I was pregnant throughout the second series, and eight months pregnant the same as Denise when the first Christmas special came out. It's probably my favourite episode, and the bathroom scene between Jim and Denise is sublime. My babies are now 22, and I wonder what baby David would be like now. 
When I watch it nowadays, it's Barbara I relate to and how she went through the menopause or the change, as Nana says it was in her day in the Sunday dinner episode. The day will come when it's Nana I relate to and I'll still enjoy watching it then, I'm sure. I have to mention the new sofa because I think Tom Courtney and Helen Frazier were genius casting as Dave's parents, who we already had an image of, and they lived up to that image perfectly. I'm on the pregnancy episode now and I love the facts along the way and can't believe for 23 years I thought a freehand tool grinder was a noble profession. Thanks for the great pod, Jackie. Well, thanks for the great email, Jackie. Great to hear that. And, you know, I love hearing about people who were watching it in real time. And, you know, we all kind of mirror the rules in our own way, but it sounds like you really kind of had the Denise archetype down there. And uh, I really dig what you say as well about the freehand tool grinder. That was a surprise for me. For some reason, I thought that was like a genius of masonry. But go back to that episode. That's the Sunday dinner episode. And, you know, where I elaborate, elucidate on the fact that essentially, if you actually think about what Jim is saying there, how could you be a freehand tool grinder? You know, there's no way of doing it. So it's kind of like a wanker. It's kind of like a, a useless person. It's, you know... That's apparently what Bob's dad was like and kind of what Jim's like as well. So, yeah, cheers, Jackie. And again, if you guys want to get in touch with me, of course, you can email me at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com. That's theroyalramblepod at gmail.com. OK, then, and let's get into Christening. This was directed by Carolyn Ahern and written by Carolyn Ahern and Craig Cash. And it first aired the 27th of November, 2000. And in we open on the final episode of Series 3, well, before we get to the Christmas special, Christening. And the title got me thinking about the royals and religion, as we've never really heard it mentioned even in passing for them as a family, as dogma, you know. Though Mary, of course, brings it into the show a few times, no doubt. Jim, I imagine, isn't really religious, as, you know, it really is the biggest cosmic swizz of all time. Anthony, well, he's a worshipper of Ali G, if anything, and Denise, I mean, she can't be arsed, I bet, with all the catechisms and the like. Maybe Barbara, though, has some belief in the way that most moms do. I mean, you know, they don't attend church or pray, but they have faith in God in some way, maybe more in hope of protection for their family than some devoutness. And Nana, well, you know, maybe she's got something stored within her for a higher power. I mean, it's company for her, I guess. Was she there for the last rites given to Elsie in the hospice? I guess we'll never know. I bring all this up then to dismiss it up front because I'm sure you may be like me. You've been christened, but you couldn't give a shiny shite about the almighty, the all shitey or whatever. I mean, christenings, especially in my eyes, are more coming of age things for the children and a way of getting them into a better school than any great step forward in the inner divinity of a child. The great excuses for knees up too and getting the family and friends together, something that's about to be demonstrated exquisitely over the next 30 minutes. So we begin with a shot of the bureau and a banner reading the baby's christening draped across. There's lots of toys and cards too. Baby David's domination of the decor seems near total at this point. The camera pans across and we can see a teddy on the sofa, streamers across the door, the baby's little red hat on the edge of a chair. I mean, they've done this a few times, the writers, you know, the, the pregnant pause as we wait inside the house with no one there. And I love it. We've seen it at the end of the wedding day, which was when everyone left, and Christmas special too. And now it's just before all the chaos erupts. There's other times like this too, like the close of Cheers, the Fresh Prince episode, What Don't You Love Me, you know, where you can hear Hillary crying off screen. It's the meaningful pan. It's a great televisual trope. And what about christenings? Where do they come from? Well, baptism, aka christening, is a form of ritual purification, a characteristic of many religions throughout time and geography. And Christianity is a Christian sacrament of admission and adoption, almost invariably with the use of water. It may be performed by sprinkling or pouring water on the head, or by immersing in water either partially or completely, traditionally three times, once for each person of the Trinity. And there really is so much Baby David stuff about. You know, he has taken over. There's a whole table by the fireplace. And we can see chairs too in the front room. So company's expected. But the chairs haven't been shifted of all of Baby David's stuff as you'd normally imagine they would be. And as the camera turns further, we can see some presents for the baby on a chair. Rolls of wood chip lent against the inner corner of the nook where they were doing the wallpaper a few weeks prior. You know, that was all for the christening, remember? And we can still see some of the scuppered skin of the wall there, which is behind a cupboard absolutely stocked with cans of lager. No cooler or ice bucket, it's just acres of warm fizz and a few mixers. There's about 20 cans or so, Tetley's, Carlsberg and the like. And we then draw further into the room from this. 
There's a balloon before the table with tons of bottles of pomaine. I mean, pomaine, come on. Lots of sausage rolls, pickled onions, twiglets, finger foods, and that like. A cake, too. Clearly, Denise has let Barbara do all this, as it's more than the standard crisps and nuts that has been spoken of before at Dave's mom's birthday do. Well, just the crisps. And it's at this point that we can hear some distant singing from behind us, getting louder. The camera swings around promptly and we're in the kitchen now, facing the door, as a motley bunch of familiar faces enter one by one. The christening goers emerging in a conga line. And what is a conga line? Well, a conga line is a novelty line dance that was derived from the Cuban carnival dance of the same name and became popular in the US in the 30s and the 50s. The dancers form a long processing line, which would usually turn into a circle. It has three shuffle steps on the beat, followed by a kick that is slightly ahead of the fourth beat. The conga, a term sometimes mistakenly believed to be derived from the African region of Congo, is both a lyrical and danceable genre, rooted in the music of carnival troops and comparses. And what an opening this is to the episode. I'm absolutely in love with this. Just the setting up of the room, the distant singing, and then the entrance of anyone and everyone. You know, I recall years ago watching this episode over an ex of mine, and I'll never forget us watching this scene, and she just turning to me, I think it was the first time she seen the episode, she just turned to me and said, I love every single character that is coming through this door. And, you know, she is not wrong. So hopefully I've set the scene somewhat for you, but let's refer to the sacred text, the ur text, that is the royal family script book, and here's what it says. Late Sunday afternoon, the TV is off and the front room is empty. The dining table has the beginnings of a buffet set on it. The redecorating is still unfinished. There are christening cards scattered around the room, along with some christening balloons tied to the baby's high chair. After a while, we hear a noisy rabble approaching. They are singing. It gets louder and louder, and then... Jim, Barbara, Dave, Denise, Baby David, Anthony, Nana, Emma, Darren, Mary, Joe, Cheryl, Twiggy and Michelle all pile into the house. They are doing the conga. Everyone has been to the feathers after Baby David's christening. Everyone is suited and booted. Nana is wearing a hat. An old Irishman PJ, who is gaunt, unshaven and wearing a large old-fashioned hearing aid, slowly follows them in. So first of all, naturally at the head of the line is Jim, of course. He's looking wedding dapper, his hair somewhat slicked down. The conga song then becomes we're on our way to Wembley at this point, and behind Jim we can see his son-in-law Dave rocking a new goatee for the occasion, which feels so painfully and so wonderfully late 90s, early 2000s. And Dave's holding baby David, who is looking absolutely darling in his little baker chef get-up. Behind Dave is Twiggy, who hasn't really made an effort. I mean, we've seen him make an effort at the wedding and stuff like that. But here he's just rocking his sportswear for the occasion, bouncing along all excited into the house. I mean, everyone is really invested in this christening conga. I'll tell you that for nothing. And behind Twiggy is a new character, the long disgust, and the one who Jim didn't want Bile to invite to the christening back in the decorating episode. It's Michelle. She who has her blonde hair all bunched back, earrings jostling, leather jacket shining, and we can hear her singing quite clearly as she passes by the camera. Behind her is Chatty Joe, who is seemingly making quite an effort and screaming ho, and as he passes us into the doorway behind him is Darren, jumping up and down excitedly, perhaps g'd up by Joe's passions or just caught up in those island rhythms. <laughs> Behind Daz is a more docile but still playful ant, and holding onto him is Emma, who we haven't seen all series since his birthday way back in series two, which was the last time there was a gathering like this, but there's even more in the pack now. So Cheryl goes into the kitchen rather than into the lounge, she's following them, and Denise goes over to her. We can also see Barb, Norma and Mary in their own delightful get-ups. Mary looking wonderful in her bright green, like one of those leprechauns, as Jim had said on the wedding day. Norma looks like the Queen Mother to me in her purple get-up. Very regal. And behind her is a new person, an interloper, PJ. A scraggy, scruffy man with white hair and a rictus grin. He looks a bit like the protagonist of Disco Elysium. I know most people listening probably won't be familiar with that video game, but it's one of the greatest games ever made. It's an unbelievable, essentially reading dystopian sim. And uh, he looks like the main character from that. I imagine it's kind of like how him from the flats looks. You know, Wurzel Gummidge, the one mentioned in the second episode of the show, who had a sliced loaf. PJ also seems to have a primitive iPod of sorts. I mean, it is a hearing aid, as we said before, but it looks like a bit of a small radio in his front pocket and there's a headphone dangling. He gets past Barb, who is pulling off her shoes, and walks towards the lounge, greeting people off camera in his own dazed way. 
So PJ goes into the lounge, and we hang on in the kitchen for a second. Norma sitting down as around her Barb, Mary, Denise and Cheryl recount the other family who were taking part in the christening. And that's a common thing that I remember from like christenings of when I was a kid or like, you know, my cousins or stuff, where they'd often do like a two for one type deal, you know? <laughs> baby call that was being christened. Oh, um, Brittany. Oh, weren't that other family dead? Oh, yeah. Brittany, a name after Denise's own heart, and of course a reference to the pop star who was then on Top of the World, and now kind of regularly posts naked pics on Insta under the aegis of some conservatorship or something. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell at the moment. And as always, the royal family loves a bit of dramatic irony, don't they? Them claiming weren't the other family dead rough when possibly the other family thought exactly the same about them, perhaps. And also, this reminds me of a rough family that I knew growing up and a christening story. So this wasn't my own christening or anything like that, but basically we have some family friends, they had a christening, and then the rough family were also there, two for one sort of deal as always. And rather than pay for their own photos, this rough family, they just jumped in the back of my family friend's photos and just kind of took it from there really and ruined the photos they'd all prepped for this other family and got their own snaps in the back, I guess, you know, to save on costs and stuff. True story, but I can't really imagine how those photos came out. So they've just got back and Mary, ever the mother, begins to prep the tarts on a plate. And Norma says how she loved the vicar, the same one from Elsie's funeral, which at first you think, oh, that's a nice bit of connectivity. But then you think, well, Elsie, didn't she live all the way on the other side of town? Because Jim had to get the bus and come back and Marion lived near Gatley and stuff. So it doesn't really work out. And anyway... Turns out the vicar was Jamaican at Elsie's. <laughs> Though, you know, it's understandable that Norma, not caring that much about Elsie perhaps, was probably distracted in the church, you know, not really paying attention, thinking about what else she could nab from that cupboard. Barbara then talks about how good baby David was when they put his head under the water, and everyone agrees he didn't cry or nothing. But Dave apparently cried buckets. I mean, good old Dave. <laughs> you can imagine Jim grimacing slightly at this by the altar, the rough family next to him, probably confused at a dad showing love to his child so openly. And speaking of ne'er do wells, Denise then asks Norma what she makes of Twiggy's new girlfriend. Denise, who you may notice, isn't really wearing a suitable get up uh, for the christening compared to most of the other ladies in the room. Her and Cheryl going for that more modern catalogue look that's more in their wheelhouse. Barbara tries to be nice here, says she seems alright, Michelle, and you know it's nice to see Twiggy happy. And I only just noticed here, watching this, making these notes, that when Barbara says this, Denise looks to Cheryl as if to say, mm, and Cheryl herself looks a little deflated at this. I mean, we've seen her do these glances a few times, not really saying anything, but saying it all with her vacancy. Norma, as we know, though, pulls no punches, however, and declares flat out that she doesn't like Michelle. Barb calls her out for this, but Norma then just doubles down, says that she's seen plenty of her type around the flats. You know, where it's like Beirut around there. Oh, well, yeah, she seems all right. It's nice to see him happy, though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I don't like her. I don't like her. I've seen plenty of her type around the flats. Nana at the flats is a spin-off I really need. And the way she delivers that line too is superb, the dismissive nature. Barbara recoiling there as well as she says it's shocked. But we get the feeling it's true, it's going to be proved true as the episode goes on. And as if to underscore this, as Norma says this, we cut straight to Michelle, up front, on screen, downing a lager. Michelle, who's played by the fantastic Sally Lindsay, loves Sally Lindsay, great actress, she's been in so much good stuff. And it's funny, really, because this was um, another thing I mentioned before on the show, that when I was young and I was watching it and I saw Peter Martin play Joe, I knew him from Emmerdale. And, you know, Darren as well was in Cora and stuff like that. And Michelle, Sally Lindsay, was in Coronation Street for a long time as well. I think maybe around this time, maybe slightly later. But still, those lines blurring, those northern accents to troops, you know, I'm, I'm just glad they're getting great work. And who is Sally Lindsay? Well, Sally Jane Lindsay is an English actress and television presenter known for her roles as Shelley Unwin in the long-running ITV soap opera Coronation Street, Lisa Johnson in the Sky One comedy series Mount Pleasant, and Kath Agnew in the BBC sitcom Still Open All Hours. Her first television appearance, this is very interesting, was at the age of seven on Top of the Pops, when her school choir, the St. Winifred School Choir, released There's No One Quite Like Grandma, which reached number one in the UK singles charts in 1980. Fuck, that's a lot better than sausage rolls and all that bullshit. And this is one of her earliest appearances, like properly, like this is her just like, you know, fresh out there. And she really kills it. I mean, you've got to imagine you're coming into a show. This is the end of the third series. The Royal Family is already acknowledged as a kind of modern masterpiece, you know, when it came.
came on like a piece of true televisual genius as we discussed loads of these episodes ad nauseum but you know for her to come into it for her to step into this whole kind of realized universe to hold her own to really make a mark like props to Sally Lindsay I think she does such a good job as Michelle I love the character of Michelle so let's get to Michelle well, she's downing her pint heartily, and behind her is her boo, Twiglet, and Jim as well is there, and they're cracking wise together. It's like when the two of them came in on Sunday afternoon. We just catch them at the end of a joke. And I love the punchline that we hear here. <laughs> so I said, I wish my widget went off every time someone pulled it. <laughs> You can kind of deduce the rest, can't you? And as ever, the pure joy that they get from each other in this moment is infectious. I mean, I'm obsessed with Jim's get-up, too, of his tie and his suspenders. It works for him, you know, being in decent clobber every now and then. Michelle doesn't really react to most of the joke, but then cracks up at the end, joining in. And behind these two, we can see Anthony and Emma, and behind them, we can see the extent of Jim and Twig's handiwork from a few weeks before. You know, there's a bit more pulled off the wall, but... Only a bit more, and it looks terrible, but not out of place, oddly fitting. Emma, ever helpful, asks Anthony, who is twiddling his suit buttons, if his mom wants any help with the buffet. And Jim catches this and says not to be daft. She isn't disabled, and Emma smiles at this. We can also see here there's a new, like, arty plate on the pillar that separates the lounge from kind of the back area where the decorating happening. Um, it's another bit of royal family honour, you know. You can't really make it out. It looks like a family, maybe even the royal family, but still, great touch. So Jim moves towards Dave and passes him a can then, and behind him we can see Darren sitting on his own, sipping, before Auntie and Emma jostle over to him, her pointing her hand towards her mate. Jim then reminisces on the bloody good drink they had in the feathers, pumping his fist like we've seen many times before. I mean, they seem merry, certainly. They've clearly gotten quite sozzled after the christening, you know. Jim then gets everyone together in the room, asks if everyone's got a drink. Michelle cheers loudly from behind. And this is where you can see why people love Jim. I mean, he is genial and a grand, friendly host. Engaging and warm. Heroic even in some way, you know. But certainly inspiring and rallying when he wants to be. Anyway, enough anti-hero worship. Twiggy behind has popped one of the bottles and is pouring it out. It seems to have fizzed over slightly and Jim then informs us that all of this was paid for out of his hard-earned bloody gyro which is the first time we've actually heard direct mention of the fact that Jim claims benefits. I mean, of course he does, but, you know, at least he can appreciate the irony in prefacing gyro with the term hard-earned. And gyro, if people aren't familiar, gyro transfer, which is often shortened to gyro, is a payment transfer from one bank account to another bank account and initiated by the payer, not the payee. And it's slang, essentially. An unemployment check, which is offered by the British government, is known as a gyro check or a gyro. And there is a Baby Shambles song as well, the Pete Doggerty band, called Killer Man for His Gyro Today, which I've uh, always been fond of that wordplay. So they're all getting together then to wet the baby's head, which is, of course, an expression to celebrate the birth of a baby with a drink of alcohol or, you know, an excuse for a drinking spree, basically. So Jim chortles at this and everyone enters. Norma in her best and the rest following. Denise goes over to baby David fussing him and Jim calls him Billy Big Bollocks as he takes him from Dave. Dave's tie just kind of sliding between them, perhaps incidentally, but it's nice and realistic. And Joe is sitting at the edge of the table. He's been there all along, I imagine, but we just get to see him now. And Twiggy, heart of gold as ever, has poured out some of the pomade to give to the elders. And Jim then begins his toast. First of all, here. Come on, Twiggy, you're the son. I'm ready. To my family, my friends, Aww. and my loved ones. Aww. Oh, and you know me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> that burn there, so unnecessary, but so funny as well. It's great to see Twiggy and Michelle break out so heavy at that. Michelle with a can in one hand and Pomaine in the other. I mean, you can see why they're so suited together, but we haven't actually got to really spend any time with her yet. And it will be a few minutes before we get like a full on scene with Michelle, as it were. And the laughter here. Twiggy's red face and his neon eyebrows as well that kind of come out, his chain, just everything about Twiggy. Jim is dedicating this drink to his grandson then, but Norma corrects him that it's her great-grandson, and it's wild to think, isn't it, that Norma would have seen all this before. They would have had christenings here, no doubt with Twig and everyone else, christenings when Aunt and Denise were just twinkles in Jim and Barb's eyes. So Jim goes on, and the camera turns to Denise, Dave, Cheryl and Barb all happily listening. 
Cheryl with her makeup slightly painted on, like the way we've seen her before, like when she came out for Jim's birthday. Cheryl, who also looks so moved by this, turning to Denise with her lips tight. Michelle, too, looks unhappy and laughs, and how can't you really? It is a really moving speech, you know, to type Jim is expert at. And here we get baby David's full name, too, which is helpfully and hilariously repeated by the rabble. <laughs> David, get out of Keanu becoming part of the name there. Interesting. And of course, one gauche zeitgeisty reference wouldn't be enough. So Ronan is added in there too. Ronan, which I imagine must be a reference to Ronan Patrick John Keating, an Irish singer, songwriter and television and radio presenter who currently hosts a breakfast show on Magic Radio. He debuted in 93 as the co-lead singer of Irish group Boyzone, and his solo career started in 1999, and he's recorded 11 albums. He gained worldwide attention when his single When You Say Nothing At All was featured in the film Notting Hill and reached number one in several countries. So everyone toasts, and Jim gives old shitty ass back to his dad Dave, then pumping his arms again and asking if Dave fancies a bit of house music. Now, this is funny, as this is one of my memories. I remember watching this episode when I was younger and asking my dad, why did Jim say house music? You know, knowing that he's going to put on, like, Sinatra or something. And at that point, in the late 90s, house music seemed everywhere. There were all these gatecrasher compilations advertised on TV. But I was told, of course, that Jim was joking. And, you know, Jim goes over to the corner to turn on the music. Dave asks if the banjo is around, and apparently Barbara has hidden the thing, which is a shame. You know, I'm sure it comes down later after the cameras have turned off and stuff like that. But they've done the banjo twice now, and it's great to see Jim with the banjo, don't get me wrong. But we don't need it all the time, do we? It is a kind of, it's a nice thing that it's there, but it's not like ever present or something like that. So Jim makes his way past the balloons, Twiggy descends on the buffet, and Cheryl does as well, while Joe just sort of sits there, staying out the way as he prefers. And house music, by the way, well, house music is a musical genre characterized by repetitive four-on-the-floor beat and a typical tempo of 120 beats per minute. It was created by DJs and music producers from Chicago's underground club culture in the late 1970s as DJs began altering disco songs to give them a more mechanical beat. So we can hear then that it's big band music going on. And Denise then asks Emma, perhaps a foreshadowing of the reveal at the end of the episode, to take the baby, you know, because Denise wants a sig in that. Everyone says bye-bye, baby David. Cheryl waves from the back, and Emma walks across the room, passing Anthony, who gets up and says he'll accompany her. Jim jokingly has none of this, though, calling for him to sit down and stating that he's an old sex pot. So Lurkio sits down, and Darren is laughing heavy at his side. I mean, you would, wouldn't you? You always do when, like, your mate's dad mocks him. It's always the best. And as this is happening, the camera doesn't cut to them, Twiggy and Michelle, but they're in on the joke, too. You can hear them hootering and hollering at the back beside the table. Hey, nobber, no, you don't. You sit there with a keep me eye on you, you little old sex pot. <laughs> <laughs> Jim turns to them to continue the joke as Cheryl behind them just keeps piling and piling her plate. The camera then moves past these lot and into the kitchen with Denise. Inside, Mary and Barbara being the dependable matriarchs they always are in prepping food. Denise lights up a cig between them as Mary begins to regale the pair and listen out here for the absolute riot that Michelle, Jim and Twiggy are having in the other room. I told you, have I? Mary. Cheryl went to see a clairvoyant in the precinct yesterday and she told her that she'd find love in either two days, two weeks, two months or two years. Isn't that marvellous? Oh, oh, yeah, man. Oh, that's oh, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? The sound design there is wonderful, and something that only really became clearer to me in headphones. The three musketeers over there, you know. But anyway, what do we make of Mary's story? Well, there's so much to unpick. First of all, there's a clairvoyant in the precinct, along with a Timpsons and a McDonald's and a Boots and the bakery and there's the card shop and, you know, a clairvoyant too. And what about what she says? So basically, if we take her on our word and say something maybe is going to happen, It's either going to happen within two days or 730. You know, what an ambit. And clairvoyance, from the French clair meaning clear and voyance meaning vision, is the hypothetical ability to gain information about an object, person, location or physical event through extrasensory perception. Any person who is claimed to have such ability is said to be a clairvoyant or one who sees clearly. Claims for the existence of paranormal and psychic abilities, such as clairvoyance, have not been supported by scientific evidence. Parapsychology explores this possibility, but the evidence of the paranormal is not accepted by the scientific community. And the scientific community widely considers parapsychology, including the study of clairvoyance, as a pseudoscience. And Mary, sweet, believing Mary, she thinks this is true. 
and she loves it for her daughter, and Barb too chimes in as if this is something to hold on to, to think about, to bank upon. But fear not, this pretense will thankfully get popped soon enough. It turns out Denise knows this soothsayer beside the bakery too. Went to her even, and she said she'd meet a tall, handsome stranger who would sweep her off her feet. I mean, the joke is kind of obvious here, but beautifully paced. Mary asks, well, who was it then? And Barbara and Denise both say Dave, incredulously. And the laugh Mary erupts with here is joyous. And uh, she told me I was going to be swept off my feet by a tall, handsome stranger. And who was it? Dave? (laughs) Mary always has a touch of madness about her in the best possible way. A frantic fizziness. But this is the first sign of a few moments that we're going to get with her in this episode, where she seems even more unhinged. You know, Cheryl before has described her as going giddy as a kipper after some permain, and she has that vibe here throughout. So Barbara says, ah, Dave, and she continues to tend to the sandwiches as her daughter smokes, and then Denise gets surprisingly reflective here. And I will say this episode has quite a lot of positive Denise character moments in comparison to pretty much every other episode, you know. She says she knows she goes on at him, Dave, but he is good. Something Barb couldn't quite say herself about her hubby. I mean, she does go on about him and he isn't good, Jim. (laughs) We then hear that Dave really does go the extra mile. Apparently in the morning he takes baby David down, brings back a cup of tea with him and then pops a cig in Denise's mouth and lights it for her. I mean, first of all, that's so dangerous. I mean, according to the government website, habits such as smoking while drinking alcohol in the home or lighting up in bed are responsible for one in three of all accidental house fires resulting in deaths. But also, it just says it all that Dave is doing all the work. You know, he's the slogger. He's the grafter. He has to get up and do it all for the baby and then baby his own wife, you know, but instead of a bottle, he gives her a sick. And then following this is one of my favourite little moments in the show as Mary asks if Dave smokes, and Denise reveals why, in fact, we never see him do it, despite his proximity to the living chimneys that are Denise and Barbara, and the reason being that he's got asthma. This is something that Mary finds an absolute riot. What, the fact that his throat could close up and he could die, you know? I suppose Mary could be finding a dark irony within him being paired with smoke machine Denise, but I think she's more just laughing for laughing's sake, and the noise is indelible. Dave doesn't smoke, though, does he? No, no, he can't, he's got asthma. (laughs) And asthma, well, asthma is a long-term inflammatory disease of the airways of the lungs. It is characterised by variable and recurring symptoms, reversible airflow obstruction, and easily triggered bronchospasms. Symptoms include episodes of wheezing, coughing, chest tightness, and shortness of breath. In 2019, asthma affected approximately 262 million people and caused approximately 461,000 deaths. Most of these deaths occurred in the developing world. Asthma often begins in childhood, and the rates have increased significantly since the 1960s. Asthma was recognised as early as ancient Egypt, and the word asthma is from the Greek, which means panting. Now, the show many times has us linger in silence for a few moments. Think of Ant and Darren banging their egg and chips together. But here, we just have laughter lasting for 15 seconds. And you know the type, you know the moment, where someone else laughs, and you're laughing, and you keep going, and there's different rising registers kind of egging the other on. You know, and Denise and Barbara kind of laugh together for a while. But then towards the end, they just kind of uniformly turn to Mary, a little worried, as she continues to titter and titter and titter. You know, it gets a little alarming there at the end, to be honest, and they aren't laughing anymore at all. It's just perfect. We then cut back into the living room, and another joke is being finished between Jim and Twiggy. This time, Twig says, smell it, missus, I'm sitting in it. And Cheryl is front and centre here in an ill-fitting pink jacket just behind them, piling a plate high as behind her some of that wood chip wallpaper is piled high against a lamp alongside with some of baby David's gear. Cheryl is just watching the three of them chat by the table and puts her hand down to grab a big pork pie and plonks it onto the paper plate. After this, the camera turns to Michelle, who tells Twiggy to stop with his jokes and pass across another lager. It's hair of the dog, this, apparently. She's hung over, so naturally, she's going to get completely rat assed And once again, Sally Lindsay's performance here is great. The way she laughs in between her words, her whole demeanour. You know, she's a girl after Jim's own heart, we hear. As we can see, PJ is sat at the table, too, kind of absently watching. As I mentioned before, it must have been slightly intimidating for Sally Lindsay to jump in this universe, but for PJ as well. But I guess he doesn't have as many scenes per se, or he isn't really the antagonist like she is, kind of in, kind of the villain in this episode, sort of, but I wouldn't really term her that directly. 
So she was hungover yesterday, she's drinking now, and Michelle just wants to get on it, though, already. She asked Jim if there's any whiskey. Jim says she's free to go to the offie, and a reply of kiss me ass naturally gets a riotous response from Jim and Twig. Jim then asks what they got up to last night. Yeah, we went and had a few hours in and a ruby. Hey, there was a bit of a to-do with Farouk and some lads that didn't want to pay the bill. Go away. Yeah. Anyway, Michelle steamed in and sorted them out. Farouk gave us three nans and pompadoms, didn't he, Mish? Mm, yeah, that's all you want. I asked that Farouk for extra chillies. But this morning, oh, talk about a burning ring of fire. <laughs> We've heard Twiggy likes the bruises before. I mean, recall Jim comparing an old girlfriend who worked in the petrol station to Lennox Lewis. And Michelle is clearly no different. I love that description of her steaming in. You can really imagine it. And her oh sound as well, talking about the ring of fire, is just hilarious. I've not really done it justice there. You've heard the clip. She's a temptress, is she, Michelle? Capping off the anecdote by saying she thinks she needs a shit house now. Grabbing a sausage roll and laughing as she leaves the lounge with it already in her mouth. Jim says... Because of course he does, this is the royal family and they love doing this, showing one thing and describing it in a completely dramatically ironic way. Jim says she's a bit of class there. Oh yeah, she's just like Emma, isn't she? With Twiggles bringing things back down to earth by claiming that she plays a good tune on the old flute as well. (laughs) The two burst again into laughter and then Dave comes by grabbing some food. Twiggy informs him that the aforementioned Farouk has a picky of him and baby David up behind the bar, which is sweet. Again, a little extra, perhaps, but a sign of how proud Dave is and how involved he is as a father. You know, I bet Denise would never even think to take a photograph, let alone gift it to someone else. I guess she did wait for Dave to get back when all the ashtray was tipped over baby David, but again, that kind of says a lot, doesn't it? It's not just Punjab Palace, though, apparently, but Dave has also given a photo to the bloke at Balti Towers and Gianni's kebab house, but he's not put that one up yet, Gianni. And behind them, we can see Ant and Emma together with Darren next to them chatting. And this reminds me, I mean, this episode's triggering a lot of memories for me. But um, there's a Chinese near one of my best friend's houses. And we used to go there a lot as a kid. And he had photos of kind of minor celebrities that he'd put up, that he'd met and stuff like that. And I'll never forget Johnny Wong, he was called. Good old Johnny. I'll never forget there was one of him and Jason from Big Brother Series 5. I don't know if you remember Jason. He lasted quite long blonde roid head that's just scorched into my mind that picture of jason as i waited for my kung pal and as ever jim sees dave's extra exploits as well a little extra and says why don't just go the full hog and have a calendar made of him and baby david there's enough bloody outfits which is entirely fair and dave laughs here we then hear from twiggy that duckers was in punjab palace apparently the elusive duckers he was there organizing a big jolly boys trip something that interestingly to me at least seems to anticipate the end of series one of early doors which is craig cash's next series where they have the big boy beano it's 149 quid all in we hear booze travel two nights a fair deal that is for the early 2000s dave unfortunately can't go even if he wanted to go he hasn't left an ease yet ever on our own for the whole two days oh my god i mean you know you'll remember the episode in decorating when they're having the bacon sandwiches with um darren in the kitchen and stuff like that that's when you hear a lot of denise's terrible mothering the you know post-birth fatigue and all that sort of stuff and how cheryl's having to take her holidays off to take care of the baby and uh yeah here's more evidence he's not even a newborn anymore you know this is damning and clearly her neglect is starting to have ramifications on the relationship as a whole let alone baby david's forming psyche Dave says Jim could look after him, maybe. But Jim says that he isn't a bloody kindergarten cop. And Kindergarten Cop, of course, is a 1990 American action comedy film directed by Ivan Reitman, where Arnold Schwarzenegger stars as John Kimball, a tough police detective working undercover as a kindergarten teacher to apprehend a drug dealer before he can get to his former wife and son. On April Fool's Day 2012 as a prank, the film was announced to be selected for release on DVD and Blu-ray as part of the Criterion Collection, a video distribution company dedicated to the release of important classic and contemporary films. It was said to have been selected as important in part because of the genre revision use of both the police and family comedy genres in the same film. It was officially released on Blu-ray, though not on Criterion, on July 1st, 2014. And yeah, Kindergarten Cop's an interesting one. I'm sure many people in my generation have seen that film. It's not a bad film, but it is an odd film because the trailers and the posters make you think it's going to be like Daddy Daycare or whatever, and it is to a certain extent. But then it's really brutal at the end. I remember watching it as a kid and being quite shocked by the uh, violence from old Arnie. And after being offered, Jim says that, you know, maybe it's for the best. Uh, you're probably right, son. I don't think you should go because maybe uh, David might think he's got no parents because he hasn't got a bloody clue. Not the best. <laughs> 
again, that motley laugh there at the end. But one of those where you joke, but you're laughing hard because, well, you know it's true what you're saying. And it is true. You know, we didn't think Denise was going to be mother of the year or anything, but the disregard and dismissal that she has for a top would be depressing if it wasn't so funny. Dave laughs a little, but Twig and Jim are just in hysterics in their own world, in their own bubble. Twiggy seems to be bursting, because I guess he's seen it all, hasn't he? He's seen from Denise being born to her now ignoring her newborn. And, you know, it is funny when someone makes light of something that is kind of troubling. And then Jim, to top it off, starts singing, I want my mammy. (laughs) And my mammy being an American popular song with music by Walter Donaldson and lyrics by Joe Young and Sam W. Lewis. The song can be considered as a tribute song by a man who, during his childhood, was nurtured by a mammy, a slave used surrogate mother, who supplanted the role that would have otherwise been provided by his biological mother. In the song, this person, now an adult, is returning to his ageing mammy and proclaiming his unconditional love for her, hoping that despite her age, she can still recognise him as her little baby. And obviously this is a majorly popular song. Versions have been recorded by Al Jolson, Cher, Dion, the Everly Brothers and Liza Minnelli, amongst others. We then cut from a song about mothers to a room full of them. Barbara is grabbing more sausage rolls and everyone is giggling. Michelle is next to the knees on the sink and she asks if baby David is a bockle or tit. Bockle. I love that little pronunciation there. Nice and unique to her tongue. Denise said that she did breastfeed at first, but of course it was easier for Dave to make up the bockle. And, you know, there's the key. It was easier. Great attention to detail here as they talk. As the two of them go on, and in front we can see Barbara dishing up the sausage rolls fresh from the oven. One of them burning her fingers slightly, and she nips her hand away as she continues to stack. Michelle, we hear, had all four of her kids on the bockle. She was going to tip feed Blaze. I mean, Blaze, of course he's called Blaze. How typical, how in the bad taste wheelhouse as Keanu or Whitney. She was going to tip feed him, but she didn't get a chance to do that as the social took him away due to her not being a fit mother. And she says that as she's grabbing a lager straight afterwards. I mean, understandably here, everyone is shocked. And, you know, it is bad, no doubt. Barbara says that it's terrible. And Michelle, she's open at least. Oh, for a man on the buckle. That's- yeah, I was going to tip feet blades, but social took away. Said I weren't a fit mother. Oh, Michelle, that's terrible. Well, to be honest, Barb, I wasn't a fit mother. I was very heavily on the piss at the time. But she had a great time with her foster parents, so it worked out well on both sides, really. <laughs> How morbid. But this, again, is why I love this show. It leans into the dark ideas, but can still make it funny. And Blaze is a girl as well, too. I I always figured a boy for some reason. But, you know, her having a great time with her foster parents is just so bleak, isn't it? And that phrase, I was heavily on the piss at the time, is hilarious, too. I mean, so particular. But they're all back with her now, which is nice, Barb says. But... Michelle doesn't quite agree, says she doesn't know the ages of any of them, Christ. As long as they're young enough not to be prosecuted, she doesn't care. I mean, probably something her parents maybe said about her when she was younger, perhaps. But the room still laughs. I mean, will she eventually have to be like Twig with Little Lee and storm off to businesses to sort people out? Probably. Cheryl then trudges in, and from behind her we can see Jim chatting with Twiggy and Dave. Joe might be involved, we can see him listening at least. So in pops Cheryl, and Barb straight away gives her a congrats. Michelle doesn't quite know what's going on, though. Everyone says they're pleased, and Barb catches Michelle up. Oh, well, Cheryl went to see a clairvoyant yesterday, and she said she'd find true love in two days, two weeks, two months, or two years. Who told you this, Cheryl? Um, Gemini Astrid up the precinct. Gemini Astrid? Yeah. For three quid? Yeah. She talks complete bollocks, she does love... Take no notice. Oh, Oh, Cheryl. Hearing it again there, we can hear what wishy-washy nonsense it really is. I mean, the fact that Cheryl mimes along at the end, alongside this, is extra heartbreaking. That she's invested, but, you know, maybe she's not. Maybe she just needs something. What with Denise, her best friend, getting everything she probably wants too. You know, sans the morning sig. Michelle is just doing her a favour here, really, though, in the grand scheme of things. I mean, she could have put it in more diplomatic terms or even just let it slide. You know, but she's right. And Barb and Mary, they seem bereft at this. Found love and now you've lost it. Better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Yeah. Barbara saying you found love and now you've lost it. Well, she got given a shitty prediction. I don't know about finding love. 
and Mary really delivering her better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all with real rueful solemnity. And Cheryl just saying a slightly ungainly, yeah, on top of all this, oh man. And Michelle not really knowing what to say after this. It's a little awkward and delicate there for a second, you know, poor deflated Cheryl. The camera just sort of hangs and sags for a while. Denise looking sympathetic, along with the older mothers, while mother of four Michelle is just kind of sipping a lager and probably thinking about how boring a shite it is in here compared to being with Jim and Twiggy out there. We can hear more laughing too from them as a sausage roll is offered to Cheryl. Something that isn't going to solve anything and probably compounds her problems in a way, but something to offer nonetheless. We then go to the first time to the youngest. Darren is asking Emma endlessly about girls that might be interested in him. And this was way before Tinder and Hinge, so what could you do really? I mean, there's an endless parade of names that comes out, and Ant just tells him straight up that none of her mates want to go out of him, alright? Which is someone being brutally honest with someone else for their benefit. Kind of like in this next scene. And here we have Michelle between Cheryl and Denise. And Michelle is telling Cheryl that she used to be her weight. Oof, what a phrase. But she went on one of those meat diets. It makes your breath stink like a pig. And the way she says it to her so didactically. But you do lose the weight, Cheryl. And then from kind of mild proddings there, still offensive, Michelle goes into a whole affront, really, to Cheryl, just belittling her in front of people, in front of her mother, you know, this innocent, doesn't want to hurt anyone, somewhat plump girl next door, defenceless, really. And Michelle is just asking her what her weight is in an intense and quite cruel way. What are you now, love? About 13, 14 stone. I don't know. I haven't weighed myself in ages. Well, what did you break the scales? <laughs> Michelle, don't be tight. That was dead tight on Cheryl, that. The fact that she says she hasn't weighed herself as she's holding a plate of food, as she has her mouth full of said food that she just grabbed from the buffet, I mean, that is perfection. The shot as well of all of the characters, Michelle kind of leaning over Cheryl almost menacingly, her dark levers against the lighter pinks of Denise and Cheryl. Denise, who is shocked at this from Michelle, The shot just hangs on the three of them. We can't see Barb or Mary at this point. And Michelle is with a can in hand, sovereigns on display, brandished. Michelle then, interestingly me for a moment, Michelle then, interestingly to me for a moment, sort of becomes Jim. As we've heard Jim say much worse to Cheryl about her weight, you know, Michelle saying, worry you'll break the scales here. Don't eat him, Cheryl comes to mind when she goes up to see baby David. But it's unacceptable her here, really, to say this, worry you'll break the scales. It's unacceptable for Denise. And it's quite nice to see her actually doing something, and that's something being sticking up for a friend of hers. Come on, Cheryl, let's go in there. Touched a nerve. <laughs> Michelle looking for laughs as she cracks up. I mean, it is funny in the kind of nastiness of it, I suppose, and the brazenness, but just to kind of mock her openly. I mean, you know, Michelle's lost weight, she says. Perhaps she feels entitled in some way to do this, I don't know. But, you know, in steps Denise. Don't be tight, she says. A great regional expression as well. Dead tight, too, as she adds. Michelle, of course, doesn't back down, though, and just like she went steaming in at the Indian, here she is fighting back. She invokes Beverly Macker, her Dave going out with her in the past, as if the mere tarnish with that brush, the mere accusation is enough for it to be a problem and a worthy weapon. Denise looks to her mom on this straight away, as Michelle said this, as if back up, as if for someone to talk through like we've seen her do so many times, but no, you know, here she has to fight on her own. The camera does pan, though, so we see Barb shocked and Mary at the sandwiches, kind of staying the fuck out of it. (laughs) He only went out of her once, Denise replies, and then gets out of there with Cheryl in tow. Cheryl, who takes her plate and her foodstuffed mush away with a quick glance before she exits. This, again, has been said before, that he only went out of her once, and, you know, Jim has said that's all it takes, and it's echoes again, it's so interesting, and, you know, they get out of there. So off they go, and there's great drama in the show as well as great laughter. You know, stuff like this has never really happened in the show. Like, we've kind of had Barbara's had enough where there was a fight and then there's the aftermath. But we haven't really seen two people argue and people storm out. And, you know, I know Anthony's done it a few times, but this is kind of a bit more of an adult, like not a teenager just getting stroppy. Like, this is just someone just kind of saying something quite cruel and bitter and someone else responding. And Barbara doesn't really know what to say. She isn't going to fight back, isn't going to defend Cheryl. She just wants to keep the peace, you know, for the christening and that. But Mary, Mary then swoops in. And again, Mary, we're worried now, Mary. And I like that Mary gets this fanciful flavour in this episode. But maybe in retrospect, that was always there in her mania and her spirit. But I don't know, these degradations are as troubling as they are hilarious. I think I have one of your children in my class. Are you a teacher? Yes. No, 
no, Mary, you're a dinner lady. Oh, yes! <laughs> <laughs> the way she says yes to that so affirmatively, as if nothing else was true in the world. But Barb is quick to snoop in and correct her here. Mary, you're a dinner lady. Which is a nice reveal, regardless of if Mary believes it. It feels right for her to be a dinner lady as well, doesn't it? And I bet she's a lovely dinner lady. And I love dinner ladies looking back, actually. I had some great dinner ladies in my past. I remember there was one in my primary school. It's like a late 90s thing with Walker's Crisps, where you get these things like pogs, like Tazos or something like that. And I remember this dinner lady just saw me and my friend messing about with them one day. I must have been about five or six, maybe younger. She's like, oh, you like them, do you? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And the next day, she gave me like 20, 30 of them in like a folder bind. Like, you know, I love you, whoever you are. I can't remember. I think she was Irish. Maybe it was Mary. I don't know, but she was great. And dinner lady, the history of the dinner lady, well, also known as a lunch lady in Canada and the US, is a term for a woman who cooks and serves food in a school cafeteria. The equivalent term in the UK is dinner lady. The role is also sometimes known as cafeteria lady. So Sometimes a lunch lady also patrols the school playgrounds during lunch breaks to help maintain order. So the cracks are kind of showing for Mary, sadly, a little bit here. And then we cut and we meet properly for the first time, PJ. And just before we get to PJ, who is the man behind PJ? Well, he's an actor called John Delaney. And to be honest with you, I couldn't find much about his career. I mean, obviously, he's in the royal family. Uh, he's in The Bill as well, Father Ted various other things seemed to have a kind of big break in his career really from like the early 2000s he just started acting again on Dublin Murders couldn't find any interviews couldn't find any YouTube stuff I think he's a stage actor obviously he's fantastic in this and he will return in Queen of Sheba as well but um but yeah John Delaney kind of flew slightly under the radar but again really holds his own here so we're 13 minutes into the episode and we finally meet PJ and his opening gambit, he's sitting at the buffet table, is to take something home for his supper. Picking up a sausage roll and putting it straight into his pocket. No napkins, of which I'm sure are in plentiful supply and Barb no doubt would have made a plate or something. You know, Twiggy always got one of those on Sunday. But yeah, I love that. I love that that's the first thing we see. It kind of sums up the character perfectly, doesn't it? Then we learn that PJ is widowed as Joe asks, Joe's next to him, Joe asks a slightly insensitive question here. Are you still widowed, PJ? I mean, you know he is, Joe. I know you're a little quiet, but that's a little slow and a little tight, maybe, of a question. But it's comedic and, you know, it works in a language sense. And PJ then turns to Joe and bittersweetly says that, yeah, she's still dead. Now, PJ, to me, it struck me on this rewatch for the notes. Is he on some level meant to be what Jim would be like without Barbara? A loose, dirty widow, you know, stealing food for later. In some form, he kind of reminds me again of early doors of old Tommy, if anyone's familiar with that. I know we got... I know we got a lot of fans of the show that listen because I kind of bang on about it every episode. But yeah, it's interesting to see the traces in PJ, you know, someone without a woman there, really, to domesticate him. <laughs> as much as you can say, Jim's been domesticated. And these two new characters, they slot in perfectly, don't they? Michelle more as mini antagonist, but not really. You know, she's not the villain or anything like that. And PJ more dressing than any real narrative factor, but a, a great inclusion. So the two of them, PJ and Joe, they nod to the truth of him still being widowed. And Joe points his daughter off screen. And there's more body shaming for Cheryl, of course, as just after the Michelle insults. Here we have PJ informing Joe in an uncouth way, similar to the way he said, are you still widowed, to be honest. I've never seen an arse as big as that. And it's the odd way he says it, like a member of the Pequod crew <laughs> may describe a grand fish. And Joe's resigned ending in this brief moment is just terrific. Cheryl, 13 and a half stone she is. I've never seen an arse as big as that. No. <laughs> you wanted them. The emotion there is freighted for me. Joe's somewhat despairing way, underscoring the sadness of Cheryl. PJ also turns to Joe right after he says it as if to reply and then it cuts back into the kitchen with the three mothers. Michelle then launches into a rant about Marks and Spencers. I mean she's such a proto-Karen here isn't she? Regaling the room with an anecdote about returning a top and expecting her money back for something she burnt with a cigarette. I mean how wild of her but how typical I suppose for her to bring something back that she knows is ruined, knows isn't worth anything and still to get angry and still to make a scene. 
And what's funny as well is, actually, I thought I might tell you guys this. This scene has real-life implications on a young me. I remember when I was a kid, one of my first ever jobs was at the next sale when I was like 15, 16 or something. And they had to ask you about, like, how have you done in customer service? Do you have any experience or anything like that? And I hadn't. So I just pulled the Michelle story out of my ass. I said, there was a woman. She brought it back. It had a cigarette burn. I had to talk calmly to her. And, uh, you know, it got me working the next sales. So Michelle goes on, ramping up in energy, the table in front of her in the kitchen stocked with food. I mean, really, Barb and Mary haven't stopped at all, from pulling stuff from ovens to piling plates to getting everything prepped. Michelle tells the room how she got the manager down to the shop floor, the M&S manager, and stuck two fingers right up at them with a childish raspberry pop of the tongue. Barbara, who laughs a little nervously at this, as if as if in her head, it's very unimpressive to her, she would never do this, but she's going to just kind of endure this slightly outrageous tale. And the structure here is great, too. Like, Michelle begins the story saying it as if she's entirely wronged. You know, here's the full story. And then when asked what was wrong with the top, as if it could have been a stitching issue that she maybe got from a bad batch, or, you know, it smelt bad or something like that, you know. She just says a ciggy burn, too, which you couldn't see unless you put it up to the light. And I mean, good Lord, it's a despicable thing, really, for her to brag about this straight away after insulting Cheryl and Denise. So the mood... So the mood is a little tense, but just when it could all spill over, though, it descends into laughter. Do you want a notice if the cashier hadn't held it up to the light? What's that old bag in there called again? That's my mum. <laughs> <laughs> so Michelle takes a swig and gestures dismissively towards the main room and asks what that old bag in there is called. <laughs> Which, I mean, she's been to the christening and the feather... Like, surely you can deduce that it's the grandmother of the fucking baby. You know what I mean? It's Barbara's mom. But, okay, maybe she didn't. Whatever. She's not too smart, as we've learned all the time we've spent with her. So it is funny for her to be so blunt. I mean, Norma, who we haven't really met, by the way, in this episode. But for her just to say that out loud, for them to be the break. And, you know, Mary just starts... And Mary's the one who kind of breaks the awkwardness, kind of cooing first. Because it is wild, on top of everything else, on top of just, like, you know, she's really upset people in this kitchen. And she's told a story where she's upset people outside of the house. And then she's just insulting Barbara's mom, you know. But Barbara just takes it in jest, really. Like, Barbara has a good attitude about things. And Michelle starts to laugh, and I love the body language here. Michelle laughs pulls forward and touches Barbara's arm as if to say, I'm sorry. We've all been there where you say something you shouldn't have said, you laugh, you touch someone, like, just a great little take there. And it's just five seconds of them, the three of them, just laughing hard and richly. And it's such a great way to close off this little section of all being involved and having a good time at the end because it had been a little fraught at certain times. And there is so much laughing in this episode. I mean, in the show, but in this episode in particular. And as always, they capture it brilliantly. Just that puncturing of that moment, (laughs) that you've been really rude here but you didn't know and even if you did know she is a bit of an old bag so it's like you know there's a lot of layers to it and uh, and I love that moment so one chuckle bunch leads to another and Jim is popping his suspenders laughing bopping his hands really having a grand old time I mean we've never seen Jim so happy so consistently and come fly with me can now be heard in the background as the lowercase house music continues Mary then dives in between the guys, so small and delicate compared to these bruisers. Her green sash and brooch combo, really noticeable here. She looks lovely. And Come Fly With Me, well Come Fly With Me is a 1958 popular song composed by Jimmy Van Housen with lyrics by Sammy Kahn. It was written for Frank Sinatra and was the title track of his 1958 album of the same name. So Mary turns to Dave and tells him how she loves the farmyard that he made for baby David. She really does. So it's finished now. I mean, we've heard talk of it from the start of Series 3, and bit by bit it's been built up both figuratively off-camera and also in our minds, and now it's had its actual unveiling. As Mary speaks, Jim and Twig behind get quiet and listen in, Jim holding his suspenders, but this time in a more suspended manner, as it were, trying to hold back. And the stinger here is incredible from Mary. Dave, I do love the farmyard you made for baby David. Do you, Mary? Oh, I do, Dave, I do. It's beautiful. It reminds me of being back home in Ireland. (laughs) Does anyone else want to come and see baby David's farmyard? It reminds her of being home in Ireland. I mean, when did she move, I wonder? What's her story with Joe? You know, is that explained a little more in the specials? I don't know, maybe, because there is a kind of a Joe-centric special, which is the final one? Isn't that right? I can't really remember. And yeah, if you think about it, Cheryl's half Irish as well. That's interesting. So the farmyard's around for public viewing, says Dave, asks if anyone wants to see it. 
Jim asks where it is. It's in the back of the van, apparently, which goes to show that it must be an abomination. It's, it's not some carefully crafted doll's house that can, you know, sit as a centerpiece in the christening room for all to gawp at as they grab their volivants and, you know, those mushroomy things, you know, mushrooms. It must be a bloody mess. So Joe is just grabbing a can as all this occurs, the wallpaper ripped in huge swathes behind him. So clearly they did a little bit more work after the Nutbush City Limits closer, but only a little bit. And Joe laughs here, engages, doesn't just glumly pass by, doesn't quite seem to get or fully hear the joke, but regardless chuckles to himself, quietly but with force, Twiggy grabbing some more drink from the table afterwards as Jim gives a double look to make sure Dave is out of earshot and then pulls into Twiggy. <laughs> Bloody hell, all this fuss over the bloody farmyard. Every day it's farmyard, this and farmyard, that. It's only an old piece of plywood with balls of cotton wool stuck on the bucket. <laughs> Sheep my ass. <laughs> Twiggy's giggles for out are delicious, those pepperings beneath. And yeah, Jim is letting us know that despite us never seeing this farmyard, I mean, how royal family, we never do see it, that it's literally a piece of plywood with some cotton wool buds stuck on it. I mean, Christ, what an offering that is. Like, I'm sure baby David would be thrilled with that, and he's really going to treasure it through the years. Twig, who is eating a sausage roll with his bare hands, as Jim tells him he's off to shake hands with the one-eyed milkman. Twiggy then bursts into real laughter and turns to the camera, following Jim a little with his eyes as he leaves. It's a great way to transition in this busy episode from his corner of the table to the one closest to the kitchen as Barbara comes in to put out more food with Mary, the two of them smiling and greeting PJ as they set things down. PJ, who has a lot of food in front of him, some beer as well, some lager, and he's still hanging out at the back. And Barb then asks something very suspiciously specific to PJ. Have you fixed that problem yet on your landing, she asks. He says no, and then clarifies to Mary that the problem is that it stinks of piss. Something Mary again has a real chuckle at, as you would really, that unmannered response, matter of fact, like, you know, it stinks of piss. Just kind of saying it right out. So is that a sewage problem or the like? Well, we're just about to find out. But before that, Darren passes Barbara wearing Norma's hat. Again, the Sinclair Jones lot are nicking, eh? But Barbara doesn't seem to mind anyway, and her and Mary laugh at it before returning to the kitchen. Barbara declares then she's going to have a ciggy, well-reserved as always, and comments that PJ's looking a lot better. Oh, PJ he seems to have really been through it, hasn't he? Like, is he the man referenced with the sliced loaf, I wonder, from the flats? Who knows? He's not as yellow as he was, Mary says gratefully, holding a butter knife in her hand, ready to dish out some more sarny soon, no doubt. And Bob? Bob then reveals the truth behind PJ's floorboard problem. He's looking a lot better though, PJ, isn't he? Yeah, he's not as yellow as he was, Bob. No. Oh, but isn't it awful about him living in those conditions, Barbara? Well, it is his own piss, Mary. Is it? Mm, the dirty dog. And he's sitting right next to the buffet. Oh. Christ. So he's just treating his landing, his upstairs hallway or whatnot, as a urinal. How grim. I mean, why? Pure disregard and depression, maybe? Giving up on things? Again, I know it's played for laughs, but the detail we get here, his wife passing, him not being very well, you know, maybe his yellowing is caused by the yellowing of the floorboards. Who can really say? And yeah, the big pisser himself is next to the buffet too, as said, which is grim. I mean, he's already taken something for his supper and will no doubt be touching it all again many times. Indeed, in a few scenes' time, we'll see the people recoil when he comes too close. So Barbara stares off into the distance, concerned, but what is she to do? Turf him up and off? I mean, it's difficult and you want to be nice. You don't want to make a scene or annoy like, well, like Michelle, who we then hear. Her crowing laughing first from off screen with Barb and Mary, and then with Aunt Emma and Darren. All three sitting in a very royal family style tableau that the younger characters rarely get to exhibit. You know the type where it's three or four of them next to each other, normally on the central sofa. And here we have that again, but more with the chairs towards Ant's corner. All three with cans of lager. Ant, who is now 18 and whatnot, is free to smoke, but you know, has been that way for a while. And they're all looking quizzical too. Darren's goofy Norma apparel, not undermining his disturbed facade as they watch Michelle. The cackling continues and Michelle really is ripping it up over there. And we can hear Twig underneath heaving in that accordion way of his. (laughs) (laughs) Anthony then dons his best Ali G impression and asks Sir Sinclair Jones his thoughts on old Michelle. 
Damashell, Twiggy's new Panani, I mean, the Ali G impressions returning again. You know, the Royal Family and Ali G, two cultural forces of that time that are still popular continuing on. Though I'd argue the Royal Family is more legendary and more timeless in a way. She's a bit rough, ain't she? Says Darren. He whose brothers are all in prison and the like. And he says that next to Emma, who is the essence of privilege, really. And then reveals quite cutely about a funny thing that Jim calls her. Yeah, my dad calls her Bastard Bill. Bastard Bill. Bastard Bill. Emma, not so impressed there. Not unimpressed, but not laughing, really. Smiling a little. The lads love it, though, and go around in circles of each other. Aunt doing the impression, Darren laughing, both of them cracking each other up, as we can still hear Borstal Bill herself careening and caterwauling at the edges of the scene. I couldn't find any reference to Borstal Bill, other than it just being, you know, alliteration, like being from a Borstal, like scum, that kind of idea. And oh man, what an amazing film that is, by the way. I watched that uh, about a year ago or so for the first time. Incredible slice of British cinema. So the scene goes on, and there's no cut really. Like we have their reaction to Michelle, Borstal Bill, we can hear her laughing. And there's great naturalistic laughter between the pair here, between these two. Michelle, she just keeps going as well off screen, hooting and hollering more and more. And it's like they're hitting you from all angles of how awful she is. I mean, we've heard about her history, her drunkenness, child neglect. We get to see her being nasty to Cheryl and Denise and overall belligerent. And on top of this, she's mega loud and rowdy and irritating. And that's a hell of a catch there, Twig. Darren then asks Emma if she wants a DVD player. There's none of the leads at the back, but they're dead easy to get hold of. So what, this was kind of ripped off a wall or something for what we can gather. And a DVD player, what a thing to say back then. It's like a mobile, like how Anthony's mobile was such an interesting thing in Elsie's funeral. You know, what an exciting format. And what about the DVD player? Well, the first DVD player is claimed to have been created by the Japanese electronics vendor Toshiba in November 1996. And the first to be released to US customers is claimed to have been by Sony in April 1997. Players slowly trickled into other regions around the world. Prices for the first players in 97 started at 600 and could top out at prices over $1,000. By the end of 2000, players were available for under $100 at discount retailers. In 2003, players became available for under $50. And six years after the initial launch, close to $1,000 models of DVD player are available from over a hundred consumer electronics manufacturers. Now, if you're of a certain age like I am, I was born in the early 90s, I'm sure you're like me, and your first DVD player was your PS2. And I'll never forget the first DVD that I got, it was the terrible Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes remake, which I saw in the cinema as well. Why did I like that film so much? And I remember watching it on the DVD player with my family, and oh, it was a thrill. So Darren, like Twiggy, uses these rural get-togethers not only as a place for friendship, but also business, offering up not only the DVD player, but then a radio cassette as well. I mean, my God, how antiquated even back then? This, which gets very little interest altogether from the young couple. Things then return to normal for the trio, and it gets quiet as Michelle can be heard to continue on and on. Anne looks off into nothingness. Emma holds her can lazily, her eyes growing wide for a second as if she was falling asleep or dozing. And Darren? Well, Darren taps his ash of his cigarette into the can he's holding and naturally goes to then drink for it straight after, not even giving it a moment for the ash to maybe dilute or something. I mean, he's not really going to do anything, is it? It's kind of nasty. And we then leave these young folk for the youngest royal and cut to a great shot, very artful for the show, of the first-person perspective of little sailor boy David staring up from his cot, little animals hanging in a little cradle above the cot. So lovely. And then back to little David himself, cutely listening and cooing along appreciatively. And Jim, well, Jim's in the room with him, and Jim is just beautiful here, isn't he? Jim maybe is most likable ever in this episode. Him saying that the little baby is a best by name, but a royal at heart. I mean, he's kind of both, isn't he? But I appreciate what Jim's saying, the sentiment. And Jim then gets really sincere here, really honest. Says that he's got lots of things planned for him and the little boy. Being in the feathers, buying his granddad a pint. I mean... Okay, sure. I mean, that is something to look forward to. But obviously, Jim's looking forward to it because it's a day in 18 years' time when he won't have to spend money. He's looking forward to that occasion, though. He's got it tucked away in his back pocket. He says that though he may be on the bones of his arse sometimes, baby David, the family will always be there to help. Jim then continues to get real. I know your dad isn't the brightest lamp in the street. And your mum wants a firework up her ass every now and again. But they love you, baby David. Does Denise love baby David? I mean, I guess of course she does, and that's a harsh thing on my part to say, but what do you think? 
She loves Dave and her family, and, you know, we've seen her cry and show gratitude, of course. And they're still in the early days, her and baby David here, but regardless, it's a glorious moment, a wonderful little mini-speech of a show of speeches that we hear a few of. Jim saying simply that little baby David is lovely, and then indulging in the classic tradition of his generation of men's hopes and dreams for their little soldiers, hoping that they'll be centre forward for England. With Jim saying people may utter, do you remember Georgie Best? Well, what about little baby David Best? And Georgie Best, George Best, was of course a Northern Irish professional footballer who played as a winger, spending most of his club career at Manchester United. A highly skillful dribbler, Best is regarded as one of the best players in the history of the sport. He was named European Footballer of the Year in 1968 and came sixth in the FIFA Player of the Century vote. Best received plaudits for his playing style, which combined pace, skill, balance, fates, two-footedness, goal scoring, and the ability to get past defenders. And Jim has tears in his eyes here as he's speaking. He's completely besotted with this little babe, and how could you not? He leans on top of the crib, looking down at him, focusing on nothing but him, until a fart escapes Jim, seemingly without warning. I suppose he's so well practiced at the time, it must be loose down there. Baby David chuckles, Jim laughs, state that it stinks, and that he'll leave that one with you. I mean, it's a stupendous scene, isn't it? It's so heartwarming. Jim, we should have mentioned prior, is obviously quite pissed at this point, so he's in a more indulgent mood. He says, good night, God bless, that everyone loves the baby, and that they're all dedicated to him indubitably. And back downstairs, we're at the youth now, and Darren says he's got a toaster for 30 quid that rouses no intrigue. Emma then asks Darren straight up for something that she wants, one of them little laptops that links up to the internet. And let's just unpack that phrase, I mean, how quaint. Obviously, nowadays, a laptop means the internet, and, you know, it's more likely you want a phone than anything else. But during 2000, I guess this was more of a unique proposition. You can do that no problem, Darren says, and Emma's impressed. Indeed, when she asks for it, isn't this the sort of thing that she could just get Roger involved with? Like, I'm sure he'd want to buy her one, you know, get her a car or whatever else. So, where can Darren actually get one from, we're thinking? Well, simply, he's going to get his brother to nick one, which is fair enough. And Ant nods his head to this, swigging his beer in a matter-of-fact way, as if, oh, of, of course, of course that's how it's going to happen. Oh, I can definitely get you one of them then, me, Emma. Can you? Yeah. Where from? Well, don't you worry about it, that's for me to know. My brother going to rob one then? Yeah. We can hear more laughter, and soon we're back into the kitchen. I, lo- I mean, how many scenes are in this episode? It's fantastic. Barbara is smiling, tending some food, as Norma is guffawing loudly, clearly in the swig of a drink, as she would want to do. And I'm absolutely in love with the framing of the shot. I love the decision to have Norma sitting up top on the worktop, beside all the sink and cleaning bottles, her legs swinging. She's a strong old sort, isn't she, Norma? 82 odd and still able to get up there. Props to her. And Barb, she's, she's there, but she isn't really in this scene at all. And we get a rare one-on-one here of, in my opinion, two of the best characters on the show, Norma and Mary. I mean, I wish we had more, but it's the nature of the show, isn't it? You get these little, little glimpses of these little worlds. So we're on the end of an anecdote, or a story here, between the two of them. As Norma proclaims happily, Oh, I do love the gays, Mary. I do love the gays. Perhaps not the kindest term there, a bit othering perhaps, but it's Norma, and she's 80 yards, she lives somewhere that's like Beirut, and you know, as we've said, she's pro them anyway, and Mary seems to be as well, despite her Catholic steel. Norma really does seem drunk here as well, Liz Smith acting beautifully, her words slurring and lying long. And Norma, interestingly, is able to pinpoint exactly when she first met one, a gay that is. It was in 1987, which, I mean, Norma's 80 odd, as we keep saying in the show. So that means she was probably in like her mid-60s by this point, older than Barb or Jim. And you know, I hadn't actually met one until 1987. And which one was Mm. it that you met? It was Moira's son, Gary. He went to work in Brighton, and he came back as one. And Mary's response to this, as Norma's saying that she met one, Mary's charming response, and which one was it that you met? I mean, as if there's only a few about, it's just beautifully delivered and very, very Mary. The person in question was the son of someone that we've never heard of before, but Norma says it matter-of-factly, as if Mary's probably heard the name before. It was Moira's son, Gary. He went to Brighton, apparently, and came back a gay. Brighton being a seaside resort and one of the two main areas of the city of Brighton and Hove in the county of East Sussex, England. Brighton is 47 miles south of London. 
And as of 2017, Brighton and Hove had a resident population of about 290,000. And Brighton has been described as the happiest place to live in the UK and the unofficial gay capital of the UK. <laughs> he calls him his partner, but we know he's his boyfriend. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> her explosion there. Her legs kicking. Retreating back hard, laughing. Can of ale in hand. Mary in front of her, guffawing along too. I mean, she's ruddy-faced at this point, Norma, and having a great time of it. Norma then reveals some insight into celebrity that she's gleaned somewhere. Kind of like how Dave knew Richard Gere was fruity. Norma informs Mary that apparently Michael Barrymore is one sometimes. <laughs> it's the one sometimes is brilliant. He's bi, basically. He, who we've discussed before, you know, legendary British entertainer, who at this point was still on top of the world, you know, who sadly had a mighty great fall. He's actually on TV during Nana's Coming to Stay. I'm pretty sure that kind of opens the episode where it's very early on. And that sometimes, too. You know, how cheeky, how naughty of them to be talking at like this. We've never really heard of Nana speak about sexuality or now like this before. And it's great, too, how it's all in one shot. The camera doesn't break. We see Barbara at the start, so she clearly is there in the room. And Norma looks to her as well and laughs at her for confirmation at points. But it's never pulled out to. It's just Mary and Norma tittering like schoolgirls. And then, as always with the royal family, they end the scene with a stinger. With a subverting line that is at both hilarious and poignant. As Norma then turns to Mary with a sincere question from the worktop. <laughs> Mary? What do they actually do? What do they actually do? I mean, in what context is she asking that question? Like, is it literally intercourse? I mean, surely Norma can figure that out from her experiences with the free and tool grinder. But it's just a fantastic way to end there. As clearly from the start then, Norma doesn't quite know what she's talking about in reference to the quote, gays. And here she is confirming it at the end. I'm just sad we didn't get to see the next bit with Mary and Barbara struggling to explain. We then cut upstairs again now with that Tarantino crib shot and sweet Dave is peering over, talking to baby David about his work day, how two of them were needed to lift the fridge freezer and then talks about his dinner, chips, peas and pudding, which is similar to his chip shop order. Denise then surprisingly comes in, perched up beside Dave with her painted nails and she lowers the defences here. So she never knows what to talk to him about baby David, which is a tacit admission that maybe she hasn't really been pulling away. Dave says he brings work up, you know, removals-wise, as if he has to clarify what he does to Denise. Well, what can I talk to him about, Denise replies, because, yeah, it isn't going to be work, is it? Dave then says, in quite a smart move, well, you could bring up what you know. Trisha, or Kilroy, or Richard and Judy. Denise adding Ricky Lake and Esther there too. These are all shows that have been mentioned prior on the programme. We then cut to baby David listening patiently. And Denise then smiles glad, realising that she's actually got loads to talk to her son about. Hopefully they're turning a corner, but mm, I don't think so, really. They do say that you should just talk, talk, talk to a baby. And even if it is daytime TV bollocks, I'm sure that has some help in the development department. We're back downstairs now, just after this. And Jimmy's urging Barbara to come over to him. And they're making a big clamour. It's their party piece. They join hands and begin to swing singing to Someday You'll Want Me To Want You. A popular song published in 1944 by Jimmy Hodges. The song became a standard and it's been recorded by many pop and country music singers, including Tom Jones, Les Paul and Mary Ford, who I love, and Willie Nelson as well. What a legend. Barbara sings along and, you know, man, they're beautiful here. How can't you get swept up? And his urge to accompany with some percussions on the spoons. And the camera does a classic royal family pan. Across from Jim and Bard, we see Joe sitting at the buffet, no doubt fiending to crack into one of his songs later. He sways, smiling. Twiggy's next to him, who's into it. Nana is sat beside Cheryl, both of them singing and clapping too. Cheryl, who has a big plate of food next to her, of course. We then pan to the three youths, who are really enjoying themselves. And to depth at those spoons is really keeping a nice rhythm. And we see Michelle, interestingly, as well, who isn't with Twig, but just on the sofa herself, really jiving along. Oddly, with a teddy on her lap, too. I mean, maybe she's planning to nick it for Blaze, I'm not sure. We haven't got much for really in the later parts of the episode. And, you know, this isn't really a traditional show where there's a villain or whatever, or a new character as an arc. She's just part of the family at the end of the day, like everyone else. The camera then returns to the two of them, Jim and Barb, and everyone gets involved as Jim spins around and people start to jive. 
Twiggy goes over to Michelle, who chuckles, Ant and Emma, of course, get a little slow dance, and he swoops her down. It's all one take, and it's truly sublime. I mean, again, every single character is remarkable, and it just feels so real, so true, so joyous. Because, of course, throughout all this, if you just figure out the production of it, like, you know, there's a cameraman <laughs> weaving in between. But you never even think that. You just feel like you're just in the room with all these people. And also, Darren and Nana dancing together, like... It must have been so fun writing this and being like, okay, what are they going to, why don't we just put them together kind of thing, you know, I love that. What a riot to see the two of them together. There's so many great character details sprinkled throughout this one moment as well. We can see PJ with Cheryl, Barb lovingly stroking Jim's face and resting her head against his. Nana really laughing with Darren with his hat on. It's just a stirring moment, you know, everyone applauding and cheering as it concludes. Cheryl hugging Barbara for some reason as well, did you spot that? And PJ continues to dance as the Irish Rover comes on. Barb, who fans her nose and puts her finger underneath her nostrils like Denise did when Dave trod dog in as he gets a little close to her. And the Irish Rover, well, the Irish Rover is an Irish folk song about a magnificent, though improbable, sailing ship that reaches an unfortunate end. It has been recorded by numerous artists, some of whom have made changes to the lyrics over time. The song describes a gigantic ship with 23 masts, though the Dubliners and Pogues version claims 27, a colourful crew, and varied types of cargo in enormous amounts. The verses grow successfully more extravagant about the wonders of the great ship. The seven-year voyage culminates in a disastrous end, however, after the ship suffers a measles outbreak, killing all but the narrator and the captain's dog. The ship then strikes a rock, turning nine times around and sinking. The captain's dog drowns in the incident, and the narrator is the only survivor, the last of the Irish Rover, if you will, leaving no one else alive to contradict his tale. So PJ's encouraged by everyone, hugs Jim, who soon regrets it, and then embraces Mary with his pissy smell. Poor Mary, who is then pulled in. I mean, she's Irish too, I suppose, wearing green. And she has to oblige. The room seemed to have settled for a second there. But then everyone's back up jigging once more. Cheryl probably doing the most exercise she ever has. Everyone's going wild. And we can hear it downstairs as we head upstairs to Dave and Denise. Dave says that baby David loves this song. Grabs one of those cute Fisher-Price boomboxes and puts on No Surprises by Radiohead. An iconic tune in the late 90s. I mean, obviously everyone knows this song anyway, but I remember this song just being everywhere, like in adverts and kind of BBC, whatever. Maybe it wasn't, maybe you just imagine that, but it was pretty ubiquitous. And it is a classic song that everyone knows. So Denise sings along, humming, you know, do, do. Baby David titters. And Dave says, see, you are a good mother. And I feel this scene is so crucial for the whole of season three, as the whole of season three has shown us that Denise is a terrible mother, really. I mean, go back and list all the episodes that I've done. But here, at least, she's making a little effort. She's going a little beyond her ken, as you were. And No Surprises, by the way. Well, No Surprises is, of course, a song by the English alternative rock band Radiohead, releases the fourth and final single from their third album, OK Computer, on the 12th of January 1998. It reached number four on the UK singles charts, and it features glockenspiel and a childlike sound inspired by the 1966 Beach Boys album, Pet Sounds. And the music video, directed by Grant G, features the singer Tom York inside a diving helmet as it fills with water. So they move their heads in unison, and each one, Denise and Dave, gives the other a kiss on the cheek twice. It's really lovely. We never get to see much affection between the two of these newlyweds for the most part, so it's nice to get this too. It's a, it's a good offering. David and Denise are then called downstairs, however, for an important announcement on Ant's part, and baby David just kind of lies there, patiently. I mean, they're so lucky that he sleeps so much. It's ridiculous. In the lounge, then, the party is continuing with a bit of Sinatra's New York, New York, also known as Theme from New York, New York, which is the theme song from the Scorsese film New York, New York, composed by John Kander, with lyrics by Fred Ebb. It was written for and performed in the film by Liza Minnelli and remains one of the best-known songs about New York City. In 1979, it was recorded by Sinatra for his album Trilogy, Past, Present, Future, and became closely associated with him as one of his signature songs. Everyone is in arms, doing the whole shebang, the kicks, the twirls, the da, 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 you know, Ant and Darren up on the sofas. And then as the song is getting into another motion, I mean, we can see Joe, like, really drawing deep and singing along, you know. We can see Twiggy and Nana and, you know, everyone just kind of not quite getting the lyrics right, but they know the vibe and all this sort of stuff, arm in arm. But then Barb turns off the music to the dismay of the mob as Anthony has an announcement. It's not a job offer, is it, Lurky? Jim says he gets a big laugh. He then gets ready. Well, well, um, you see, me and Emma, um, we get engaged. <laughs> so he pulls Emma up with him, stating that they're getting engaged. People seem happy. Darren pumps his fist hard beside. Jim and Bob 
are a little more knocked sideways by the whole thing, understandably. I mean, they are only 18 at this point. And again, the endings of these episodes. You're not pregnant, are you, Emma? Barb asks sweetly. And Jim is straight in with the, of course she bloody is. And there we have it. I mean, truly one of the greatest episodes of the show. Certainly the biggest confluence of characters we've ever seen. Some great narratives as well. Really introduces new people terrifically. I think it's a wonderful show. And again, it's just like, give us a little bit more. Like, Let's just see the aftermath of this being said. But that isn't the show, is it? We're just going to skip ahead now to the Christmas special, which is the next episode of the podcast, where we're going to see more of the aftermath and meet Emma's parents and stuff like that. Can't wait to get to Roger and Valerie and everyone else like that. But until then, this has been the christening episode. You know how it is. Tom Quee presents The Royal Ramble. An episode-by-episode celebration of the classic British sitcom, The Royal Family. To get in touch with the show, email us at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com.